Massachusetts public education law guarantees a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment to all school age children through age 21, regardless of disability. However, when school districts and families disagree on what is appropriate, children are often left behind. Case in point, education reporter Manny McLaren has been reporting about Samantha Frashan, a young woman with special needs in Braintree who has been absent from school since September 2023. Mandy joins us now. Mandy, thank you for being here. And first, tell us about who is Samantha Frashan. Sure, Samantha is a 14-year-old girl and she's really terrific. She loves to draw. She likes to take care of her pet parrot named Kiwi. <laughs> she makes her mother tea. And, you know, she's just your typical 14-year-old girl in a lot of ways, but she does have certain disabilities that make it very difficult for her to learn in a typical school setting. She has some trauma history in her background. She has generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, and autism. And because of that, a regular school is really overstimulating overstim for her and can make it difficult for her to learn there. Well, let's talk about regular school and the school where she was thriving to all accounts. She was doing well at Fusion Academy. Why is she no longer there? Sure, so Fusion is a private school in Hingham, nearby Braintree where she lives. And she was there thriving. They specialize in one-on-one -on -one instruction, so it's a much smaller setting for her. And so she was doing well, got all A's on her report card. Even socially, she had started a school walking club. And this was in her seventh grade year last year. But before she could start eighth grade there, Braintree Public Schools decided not to re-enroll her. And according to Braintree, it's because they only ever considered that to be a temporary placement. They also point out that Fusion doesn't necessarily enroll, um, ha employ special educators. And so Braintree made a decision unilaterally to not re-enroll her there, which is contrary to special education law, which kind of requires you to have a team meeting with the administrators, teachers, and the parents to make decisions like that. So she's actually been not in school since the beginning of this school year um, once Braintree made that decision. And when that decision is being made and everyone is really supposed to be uh, uh, arguing or having conversations about what's best for the child, where should she have been? Well, this is the argument, right? And this okay. actually landed everybody in court about this. And so there's something called the stay put provision of federal special education law that says while adults sort of wrangle over what to do about your future placement, you have a right to stay put in your current placement. Mm -hmm. Now, her family and her attorney argued that Fusion, that school she was thriving at, was her stay put placement. But then it goes back to the school district that says, no, actually, that was just temporary. And it kind of gets a little bit more complicated than that. But essentially, um, when this did make it in front of a court, in front of a judge, um, the stay put provision sort of got tossed out the window. What do you mean by sort of got tossed out so, of the window? Because like this, this is law. Of, you like, don't hang halfway off the window, no. Um, the judge essentially said that... Um, the stay put provision wasn't her main priority. Her main priority was the fact that this girl had not been in school of any setting the entire school year and she said that was causing her irreparable harm. So rather than debate what the stay put provision was, that we, she just needed to get her back in school as soon as possible, which is what happened this week. Yes, yeah, speaking of this week, she went back to school and you have been following the story and right by Samantha and her, and her mother's side while this has been playing out. What happened when she uh, attempted to attend school recently? Yeah, so I went over to their house yesterday morning and this was her first day back and the judge's ruling, the implication was that she'd have to go to a regular middle school. She hasn't been to a regular public school since she was in second grade. So we're talking about a thousand students, a very big school building, lots of staff, people that she doesn't know, and she was extremely nervous. She had made this stack of fluffy chocolate chip waffles for herself, sort of just to fidget and, and get her mind off of it, but then she couldn't eat it at all because she, her nerves were making her so nauseous. And so a photographer and I went with her and her mother um, to the school doors and, you know, then they disappeared inside and uh, essentially Samantha started having a little bit of a breakdown, had to go see the nurse. And then once her mother left her behind, um, it was not there long after that her mom started getting phone calls from the school 
Um, and many times Samantha was on the other end of the line saying, Mom, please come get me, please come get me. I don't want to be here and just really having that sort of nervous panic attack feeling that her anxiety causes her, especially when she's in a new environment like that. You hear a story like this and we want to point fingers and try to find blame. The school that Samantha was attending where this, this breakdown happened, are, are they culprits in this? Are they, I mean, are they properly staffed or improperly staffed? Like, what, what role do they play in all of this? I think they feel like their hands are tied almost as much as Samantha and her mom feel that way. You know, they, just like the family, have to listen to what the judge says. Even if they're admitting right now, even if they're saying this, like, we, we don't have what this girl needs, their, their hands are tied and that the judge said she needed to come here. And so, you know, I was listening to the phone calls yesterday with the behavioral therapist, with the assistant principal there, and they were trying their best to, you know, engage with Samantha to maybe, maybe get her started on some schoolwork, but she was just so in her head that, you know, they couldn't get through to her. Is this a snapshot of what all parents who have special needs students or special needs children face in Massachusetts. You write about 10,000 students require uh, specialized education and Samantha is one of those 10,000. Is this what parents should expect to happen if they are in a similar situation? I think a lot of parents who have students with disabilities that don't look like a disability. Okay, what, so, what, what does that mean? So if you have um, a child who is obviously disabled, let's say it's a physical disability or maybe they are deaf or blind, it is easier in a sense to get them into a specialized school. If you have a disability that's not as obvious, maybe it's dyslexia like we've talked about mm -hmm. before. In this case with Samantha, it's autism and really crippling anxiety. Parents feel like in order to get them to those placements where they're going to be served appropriately, you have to put them through the ringer. You have to show the district over and over again that she's being failed and that every time she's enduring some new level of trauma, right, when you put her in those situations. And so that was what the family had gone to court and said, we can't keep trying X, Y, and Z. Why don't we just stick with the one thing that we know that works for her? So parents are having to escalate this to legal remedies, to legal ramification, having to sue the district to have their children uh, get the education that best suits them. Well, it's actually interesting. Under federal special education law, you parents' hands are again tied. You can't actually sue the district until you've, quote, exhausted all legal remedies within this really technical, bureaucratic special education dispute process. So they wound up in court um, on a special provision, but parents, they have to go through these systems that the state has set up, and they're often very slow. They typically side with the districts, and again, it's just sort of this ongoing one trauma after another. This is a story that you've been on, Mandy. What happens to Samantha now, if you can tell us? Sure, I think there was a question this morning about whether or not Samantha was gonna even be able to get out of the house, and she did. I've talked to her mom, and she went into the school, so they were trying, but pretty much immediately after she got in there, she started to have another panic attack, wound up in the nurse's office, and at a certain point, she eloped, she left the building, um, and last I knew, she was in the parking lot, refusing to go back inside, and both her mother and the school officials didn't know what to do. This is a story that I know you've been covering and we will be watching very closely. Education reporter Mandy McLaren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. For daily access to Boston Globe Today, all segments and episodes are available on demand in the Boston Globe app by clicking watch.